Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, which means peace be upon all of us and all of you. And we're very happy that we have a, a good crowd today. This is a, as a part of a series that we've done after September 11th. We've had, a, I guess, the sharing of faiths of many different groups of people. This center is an Islamic institution, and the Tawheed Institute is an Islamic school. The word Tawheed meaning uh, the oneness of God. Though it's an Islamic school and though it's an Islamic center, we're not going to be biased here of anybody or any group. I guess the main purpose that we're here today is to, I guess, to share faith, to get an understanding of each other. I was speaking to Dan before, and if people can leave today with just an understanding of each other and some and just, I guess, an ability to think differently. Because, I, I guess, the last year, people have felt very sad of what is happening in the world. And if the stereotypes go away, and the unity of us human beings being together as one begins to flourish, the world will be a better place. And how do you do that as, a, as an individual? How do you promote uh, happiness with each other and, and brotherhood, as we call. And the only way to do that is to get to know each other. And one of the best ways to get to know each other is to get to know our faiths, what we believe in, what we stand for. And I saw a very nice t-shirt about there. It's a New York, New York City Atheist Club. Interesting. First time I saw that. And I'm sure you'll see uh, New York Institute of Islam and different groups. And it's not to show that we're angry with each other just because somebody's different, but I think to say that we are all human beings and the only way that we'll be prosperous and successful is that we live in peace. Going back to the Tawheed Institute, it's an institution that we started 14 years ago and, and its goal was to educate the youth. And hopefully today, after everybody speaks, that we'll all be better educated on the belief in God and the, um, and the belief in the other groups of who don't believe in God. Um, I'm not going to introduce the speakers, the, the moderator will do that. But I'll ask one thing, and it's a very touchy subject, especially for those, I would say, being a Muslim, I can talk for myself. When someone to me comes to me and starts questioning God to me and maybe putting down God to me. You know, it's, it's very sensitive. But I would ask everybody to just put away their emotions today and open up their minds. And no anger and animosity should come from this. What should come from this is more unity and more brotherhood. And I think in the end, we'll see that. And we'll be happier as people and successful as human beings. So, without going any further, I'll call the moderator and he'll introduce everybody. What we'll, what we'll do later on is, to us, by you being here is a gift to us. And in the end, we'll have gifts for you, especially for those who have not been to this center. There's books and Qurans and different things for each other to read. And I think that will bring the next step where once you hear the, the information, you need to go further and study, and I think that will help very much. Thank you. Uh, there's a request. We're starting, usually in an Islamic institute, what we do is we start with the recitation of the Word of God, which we call the Quran. It's the last revelation of God. So we'll ask Brother Abbas Pira, Please come up and recite something for us. And Abbas, you'll also recite the translation. Thank you. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Ar-Rahmanu al 
علم القرآن خلق الإنسان علمه البيان الشمس والقمر بحسبان والنجم والشجر يسجدان والسماء رفعها ووضع الميزان ألا تطغوا في الميزان والسماء وأقيم الوزن بالقسط ولا تخسر الميزان والأرض وضعها للأنام فيها والنخل ذات الأكمام والحب ذو العصف والريحان فبأي آلاء بكما تكذبان خلق الإنسان من صلصال كالفخار وخلق الجان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان آمنا بالله وصدق الله العلي العظيم In the name of Allah, the most gracious, most merciful the beneficent. It is he who has taught the Qur'an. He has created man. He has taught him speech and given him intelligence. The sun and the moon follow courses, and the herbs and the trees both alike bow in adoration. <clears throat> and he has raised the ferment high, and he has set up the balance, in order that you may not transgress. So establish weight with justice, and do not fall short in the balance. It is he who has spread out the earth for his creatures. Therein is fruit and date palms producing spathes. Also corn with its leaves and stalks for fodder and sweet-smelling plants. Then which of the favors of your Lord will you deny? He created man from sounding clay like unto pottery. And he created the jinns from fire of smoke. But they called... Then which of the favors of your Lord will you deny? Sadaqallahu al-Ali al Thank you.
Thank you very much, Abbas. That was very much appreciated. My name is Muhammad Atar Lila, and I have the pleasure and the honor of being the moderator of today's debate. Before I begin with outlining how the program will proceed today, as well as a few rules of decorum, and finally by introducing the speakers, I suppose I should mention a little bit about myself. I'm currently completing my master's degree in journalism at the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia University, where one of the first things we're taught is to identify our biases, then declare them, then promptly throw them out the window. So I suppose I should identify some of my biases. I am a practicing member of the Islamic faith. Uh, I'm also from Toronto, Canada, if that means anything. Um, and I enjoy the occasional game of ping pong. All humor aside, I promise that today, to both of our speakers, this is a personal pledge that I make to you, I will be as even-handed and as fair as I possibly can be, and that reigns especially true for the timings. Um, some of the segments that we have have been allotted a specific amount of time, so please don't be upset if I have to cut you off halfway. I will give you both a one-minute warning so that you know that the time will be running out um, so that you can plan your talks accordingly. It's also a great pleasure to see that this auditorium is at capacity. I see there may even be some people who are standing at the back. For those who come late, um, please try to find a seat if possible. If not, please speak to one of the organizers. We can try to bring in some other seats for you. And this afternoon, we have two very distinguished and qualified speakers to bring focus to the question of the debate, and that is, does God not exist? I'll begin by explaining a little bit about how the program will run. Uh, for those of you that entered, you would have seen a table directly in front of you. There is a program itinerary on that table, for, but for those of you that do not have it, Dan Barker will begin with opening arguments against the existence of God, and that will run for approximately 20, exactly 20 minutes, um, followed by a rebuttal by Hassanein Rajabali of 10 minutes, followed by a reply from Dan Barker of five minutes. That process will switch over and following this, um, Hassanein Rajavali will give an opening argument about the existence for God, or an argument for the existence of God, and again, that will be 20 minutes. Dan Barker will have 10 minutes to reply, followed by a final rebuttal from Hassanein, five minutes. After that, we're going to have a break for about five to 10 minutes because many of us will need to stretch or uh, walk or probably even absorb some of the things that will have been said. And then we will have closing arguments from both speakers, followed by a 30-minute question and answer session. Um, now, for the question and answer session, um, in the interest of fairness, what we're going to have done is we're going to ask all of you to write down your questions on the pieces of paper that will be provided. Um, they will be distributed shortly before the question and answer session begins. And once you've written down your question, please hand it to one of the organizers, either myself. Um, there are some organizers sitting here at the left. Ali, if you can just raise your hand as an organizer, he's here or is Hani at the front, um, just hand your question to one of them and we'll make sure that it gets sent to the front. Please accept our apologies if your question is not answered. We do have a very short amount of time. 30 minutes is not a lot of time, um, especially since many of you will have many questions. And before I introduce the speakers, I'd just like to go over some of the rules for today's event. The first rule is, it's not really a rule, it's more of a direction. It's probably the most direction we'll give for the rest of the evening. Washrooms are available just outside the hall. If you go uh, outside the hall, turn right and then turn left. There are washrooms there. Um, there's both men's and women's washrooms. They have big signs on them, so please make sure you go into the right one. Um, also, if you feel the need to get up during the program, this is a, an important announcement. Uh, please do so with as little disturbance as possible to those sitting next to you, sitting behind you. And this is especially true for the first three or four rows in the front where the cameras are. If you do feel the need to get up, please try to walk outside of the line of sight of the camera. Um, it will make things a lot easier um, for, the, for the camera crew, as well as ensure that um, your uh, big um, uh, body doesn't get in the way of um, the camera. And um, on that note, just please note that there are no unauthorized recordings of today's event. Um, this includes audio recordings, video recordings. Um,
Just one second. Okay. All right. I've just been advised by the organizers that as much as possible, um, since this is an Islamic institute, there are certain rules of decorum. And one of those is that we're trying as hard as possible to keep the men on one side and the women on the other side. We are, I'm told, in the process of bringing more chairs down um, for those of you who do not have chairs yet. So um, just please hang in tight. The chairs will be coming very soon. As I was saying, there are no unauthorized recordings of this event. Um, there was a, a sign-up form outside. Uh, there will be copies available to those who wish to order them. Um, and the forms, again, are outside. But please, at this point in time, uh, turn off whatever video recording you have, whatever audio recording you have, and we'll ensure that if you do want a copy of the program, we will get it to you. Another rule, just to uh, speed things up a bit, cell phones, pagers. Someone once told me when I was young that the only people that should have cell phones are doctors and drug dealers. So unless you're a doctor, I ask that you turn off your cell phones and pagers it's very disrespectful to have a gathering when a cell phone goes off. It disturbs the speakers. It interrupts their speech. And um, <laughs> hello. No, I'm I'm moderating a debate right now. Hmm. Okay. So if you could all, following my lead, turn your cell phones off and your pagers off, that way the, the program will not be interrupted again, and my apologies for that interruption. The last thing that I just wish to reiterate is something that Muhammad Jafar reiterated earlier, is that in debates of these nature, it's very easy to get emotional, and it's very easy to let our emotions take control of us. Um, but I would just like to reiterate again that out of respect for the speakers, if we could refrain from any kind of negative responses any kind of jeering, uh, perhaps even booing, or even excessive cheering, if we could just refrain from that to keep a proper decorum and, and to show the speakers the respect that they deserve, um, that, that will help our program run smoothly. Just a note for some of the uh, non-Muslim friends and visitors that are here today, you will have noticed that after the recitation of the Quran, the Muslims responded with a, a phrase in Arabic. And essentially that phrase in Arabic is invoking blessings upon the Prophet. And oftentimes this is how Muslims, um, rather than clapping, they express their appreciation for a speech or a talk or any kind of uh, thing that's done for the public. They express their gratitude by invoking God's blessings upon the Prophet. So please do not be startled by this. Um, it's a normal thing that when you go to a Muslim gathering, this will happen often. However, we do ask everyone, Muslim and non-Muslim, to please um, keep the responses, including the applause, and God forbid there should be any booze to a minimum, um, and that, that will help us go smoothly. Now, I've talked enough, let's get to our speakers. To my left, Mr. Dan Barker is a former evangelical Christian minister who preached for 19 years before giving up his faith in Jesus and belief in God. He received a degree in religion from Azusa Pacific, Azusa Pacific University, uh, was ordained to the ministry and served as an associate pastor in three California churches. He spent a total of two years as a missionary in Mexico and eight years as a cross-country evangelist. In 1983, following four to five years of deconversion thinking, Dan became an atheist. He now works as public relations director for the National Freedom From Religion Foundation in Madison, Wisconsin. As an aside, he's also married and has five children. Let's welcome Dan Burke. To my right, we have Hassanein Rajabali, who is the principal of the Tawheed Institute of New York. He's a popular speaker locally and has traveled worldwide to lecture on Islam. He is also a frequent lecturer at Columbia University on behalf of the Muslim Students Association. He has a master's degree in molecular biology from the University of Colorado and presently owns and operates an internet e-commerce company called NetSite Corp, based in Elmsford, New York. Hassanin has come to settle, Hassanin came to settle in the United States in 1975, emigrating from Tanzania, East Africa. Let's all welcome Hassanin Rajabal. <laughs> 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 
And with that, I believe, gentlemen, you both know the rules of tonight's debate. If you have any questions, I'll just be seated at the side. And with that, I'd like to invite Mr. Barker to take the Thank you, Muhammad, for that very entertaining introduction. Very nice. I also want to thank all the other organizers and inviters, especially Ali Kafan, who I thought was single-handedly putting this thing on, but I guess he's had a lot of help with Mohsen and uh, others. So it's very nice to be working with such gracious people as Ali and his helpers. He's also very generous and a very capable organizer, and I appreciate the opportunity to be a guest in this place. There are also some free thinkers here. There are some members of the Freedom From Religion Foundation here. I recognize Irving, who comes to everything in the country. There are members of the Atheists of New York. Uh, another member who is uh, uh, a student at, uh, at Columbia University with some of the friends there. Richard Carrier is here. So welcome to you and thank you for coming. There are millions of good Americans who do not believe in a God. And on the planet, there's about a billion people who do not believe in any kind of a God. Most of them are Buddhists, but there are a lot of other non-religious people who don't believe in a God. I used to believe, as you know, I believed firmly and strongly. I was the devoted disciple of Jesus. I spent many years preaching, and I changed my mind. I can't tell you the whole story. I can show you my book. Uh, it's not for sale today, but it is available through uh, different sources. Losing Faith in Faith from Preacher to Atheist. Going from a firm Bible-believing Christian to an outspoken atheist. Or if you'd rather hear it in musical form, I have a CD called Friendly Neighborhood Atheist with 34 songs expressing in an artistic way my lack of belief and my pri pride at being an atheist and a humanist in this world. Now I am a very happy, moral person without belief. For me, the only guide to truth is reason. Not faith, not tradition, not authority, and not revelation. The only way to know what is true or false is through reason. Now, this is the Islamic Institute, and I'm so happy to have a chance to get acquainted with Ali and the others here, but I am not an expert on Islam. So if you want to score some points, Hassan, ask me some questions on the Quran, because uh, I've read much of the Quran, but I'm not as familiar with the Quran as I am with the Bible. But uh, if you do want some information that is critical of Islam specifically, and critical of the Quran, and criticism is good, we should all welcome criticism, because by meeting it, it strengthens our faith, doesn't it? I will recommend to you a wonderful book I just read by Ibn Warak, Why I Am Not a Muslim. He was raised as a Muslim. He's a scholar. He's an Islamic scholar. He knows these things better than I do. So uh, if, it, if any of these things come up, I have to defer to his expertise. Hassan, you and I have a lot in common, a lot in common. When you say that there is no God but Allah, you are telling millions of good Hindus that Vishnu does not exist. Shiva, Devi do not exist. And I agree with you. You are right. Those gods do not exist. You and I are both unbelievers in those gods. When you say there is no God but Allah, you are telling a billion good Christians on this planet that not only is Jesus not God, he's not even the Son of God. And I agree with you. The Trinitarian God of Christianity does not exist. You and I are both in agreement. We are unbelievers in that God. When you say there is no God but Allah, you are telling the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Norsemen, the Mayans, the Aztecs through history, that Osiris and Zeus and Mercury, Thor, Quetzalcoatl, they do not exist. And I agree with you. You are right, Hassan. Those gods that were worshipped by millions of devout believers, those gods do not exist. 
The only difference between you and me is that I believe in one less God than you do. Basically, we are the same. We are unbelievers. Did you know that the early Christians were called unbelievers by the Romans? Because they did not believe in the true Roman gods. Although they had their God, they were called atheists. Atheism, in its most general sense, is the absence of a belief in a god or gods. Atheism, with a lowercase a, is not a belief system. It is not a creed. It is not a system of morality. It is simply the lack of a belief in a god, for whatever reason. Most agnostics are atheists, by this broad definition, because the word god could mean anything. And you can't possibly disprove the existence of something that is not clearly defined. However, when it comes to a particular definition of God, such as the Christian God or the Islamic God, I go further than just the negative, soft, lowercase atheism, and I make the positive claim that that particular God does not exist. In that case, I am an uppercase atheist, especially when it comes to the gods of the revealed religions. I am convinced and I claim to know that those gods the Christian God, Allah, does not exist. It's not a belief, it is a claim of knowledge. The word God is minimally defined by the Abrahamic religions to be a personal being who created and maintains the universe, who is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good. There are more to the definition, but in minimal sense, that is how God is defined, and that is the God we are debating tonight. Such a God is fictional. Such a God does not exist. First, I will give you my lowercase reasons, and then I will give you some positive uppercase A reasons for this claim. First of all, it's the lack of evidence. If there's anything that's obvious, it is that the existence of God is not obvious. Even the Bible says that. Truly, you are a God who hides himself. Because if there's a God... Where is he or she or it? Now, some people say that the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. But I disagree. If something is truly non-existent, then the only evidence we could possibly have for its non-existence would be the absence of evidence for its existence. The absence of evidence is not proof, but it is certainly evidence. If God is obvious, if God does exist, if there is evidence for him, then why are we having this debate? We don't debate things like gravity. We don't debate things like, uh, you know, who is our president or does Saudi Arabia exist as a country? We know these things by evidence. If there is a God, if there is evidence for a God, then why are there unbelievers? Why are there atheists? Are we just blind? Are we uh, just in inherently evil and we just want to close our eyes to something that others claim is so obvious? The very existence of a billion non-believers on this planet, it's not proof, but it is certainly evidence. I offer myself as Exhibit A. I do not believe in a God. It is not evident to me. It is not obvious to me. What if, what if scientists were to gather together every Sunday morning, like Christians do in church, and hold hands and bow their heads and pray and say, yes, gravity is real. I know that gravity is real. I will have faith. I will be strong. I know in my heart that what goes up must come down, down, down. <laughs> what if they did that? You would think they were pretty insecure on the concept, wouldn't you? And that, that's what religious people are always doing. They're getting together. What if, what if scientists were to get together every Friday, and bow to the north and say, there is no law but evolution, and Darwin is his prophet. There is no law but evolution, and Darwin is its prophet. What if they said that over and over and over and over again? Wouldn't you think they were somewhat insecure? They're trying to talk themselves into this thing for which there is no evidence. And that's what most religions do. They talk themselves into it without any actual evidence that they can show me um, or what if gravity is real and Isaac Newton is its prophet? Isaac Newton, probably the greatest mind of science. 300 years ago, he figured out the laws of gravity. Isaac Newton believed in a god. 
And when he figured out the laws of gravity and the orbits of the planet, the elliptical shapes and all that, it was a wonderful revelation to our world. Not by revelation, but of course by reason. He figured it out and he proved it with reason. But Isaac Newton was stymied. As great a mind as his, he bumped up against some things that he could not figure out. He did not have an answer for why all the planets were in the same plane. How could that be? Why? Or why they were all going in the same direction. And you know what the great scientific mind Isaac Newton said? He said, that is evidence of design in the universe. That is evidence of choice. That's proof of God, the fact that they're in the same plane and go the same direction. Well, we now know that Isaac Newton was wrong. We now know that this gap in his understanding does have an answer. We now understand something about the formation of solar systems and planetary systems. We now know why they're in the same plane in the same direction. But in his time, it was an unknowable thing. He had this huge gap in his mind, and he said, well, I don't know the answer, so God is the answer. There's a big gap, and he plugged it with his God. How convenient. He had a gap in his understanding. He plugged it with his God. And that's basically how the arguments for the existence of God have all boiled down. Christians and Islamic and Jewish theists and others argue, well, there's some gap in our current understanding of science, therefore I can plug my God into that gap. Years ago when it was thundering and lightning, they didn't know what caused it. So Zeus did it. Thor did it. But now we understand electricity and the weather patterns, and Zeus and Thor have died. They're gone. Except we do have a day of the week dedicated to Thor. Fertility of the soil. They used, to, they used to wonder, how, do this, how does the crops grow? So they had a goddess named Hera. But now we understand more, and that gap is closed, and that god has died out. Now, I expect Hassan is going to give some of these arguments for the existence of his god, and I will re attempt to rebut them during my rebuttal time and attempt to show that many of these arguments are basically just god of the gaps. They're arguments from ignorance. I would also ask you, and I will ask you if I get a chance, Hassan, uh, if you do expect me to disprove God, then tell me what you would accept as a disproof. The principle of falsifiability, I think, is useful. It may not be 100% perfect, but it's useful. For any statement to be true, there must be things that can be said about that statement, which, if true, would make the statement false. And the failure to prove these falsifiable statements true strengthens the truth claim of the original statement. For example, if I'm a short, fat, redhead, you can say he's not a tall, skinny, blonde, right? And if I were a tall, skinny, blonde, it would falsify that I'm a short, fat, redhead, right? There have to be statements you can say about your claim which would falsify it if they were true. So I'm going to ask you, give me an example of a statement which, if true, would prove your hypothesis false. What would you accept as a disproof so that we're having a fair debate? Now, here's some positive arguments for the non-existence of God. Suppose God is defined as a married bachelor. Does he exist? Well, you don't ask, does he exist? You can just say he cannot exist. A married bachelor is, is discrepant. You can't have such a thing. And there are about a dozen different ways that God has been defined in the revealed religions that are mutually incompatible definitions of God that cannot exist in the same being. For example, here's a trivial, trivial example, and I will move on to a stronger one later, but here's a trivial example. If God is de defined as all-merciful, or infinitely merciful, as I've heard some um, Muslims say, and if God is also defined as a just God, then such a being cannot exist. Because why? What does mercy mean? Mercy means that you give punishment with less severity than is deserved by the crime. You committed this crime, you deserve this punishment, but be merciful to me, God, and so God gives you less punishment. Maybe he sets you free. Maybe he's infinitely merciful. By the way, if God is infinitely merciful, then I'm not going to hell, right? If he's infinitely merciful, no one's going to go to hell. But that's a side point. But to be just, what does it mean to be just? What is justice? Just means that you have punishment that fits the crime. You commit a crime, you get this punishment. That's justice, right? We want justice in the world. But if God is all merciful, infinitely merciful, then he can never be just. If God is ever just, only once even, 
then he cannot be all merciful. He has to be sometimes merciful and sometimes just, but he cannot be all merciful. So it follows, a God who is defined as all merciful and just not only doesn't exist, but cannot exist. Here's a stronger one, though. God is defined as a personal being. To be a personal being, you have to be able to make decisions, which means you have to have a potential of uncertainty. Tomorrow I'm going to decide something, but before then I could change my mind, right? So I'm a free personal being because I have that ability, at least in principle, to change my mind. If I didn't have that ability, then I would not be a free agent, a personal being. But God is also defined as all-knowing. He's defined as omniscient which means that not only does he know everything about the past, the present, and the future of everything, but he also knows all of his own future decisions. If God knows all of his own future decisions, and if the set of future facts is fixed by his omniscience, then that puts some limits on his power, doesn't it? He's not able to change his mind between now and then. He has to go like a robot or a computer program. He is stuck. If he knows the future, he can't change it. If he goes ahead and proves his power by changing it anyway, then he wasn't omniscient in the first place, was he? So this is a shorthand version of saying that a God who is defined as personal and all-knowing not only does not exist, such a God cannot exist. He either has freedom or he doesn't. And if he knows the future, he has no freedom. I call that the free will argument for the non-existence of God, or F-A-N-G for short. Another problem, another Mary Baxter problem is the idea of an immaterial mind. All we know about minds is that they exist within some kind of a physical housing, a human brain or a computer or something. We have no evidence or no coherent definition of a mind or a spirit that can exist apart from something physical. Another evidence for the non-existence of God is that all these God believers claim, virtually without exception, that believing in God makes you a better person makes you more moral. Believing in God is how you can live the good and right life. But when you look at the lives of believers, you don't see better lives. You don't see... Uh, Muslims are not more moral people than atheists. They don't love their children anymore. They don't provide for charity anymore. Uh, Muslims, Christians, and Jews were just about the same. In fact, in America, non-believers score better than Christians do on a lot of these moral, charitable things. And if there is a God who gives us these absolute moral standards, then why do no believers agree on what they are? Take the death penalty, for example, or abortion rights, or gay rights, or, or euthanasia, or women's rights, or doctor-assisted suicide, or stem cell research, you name it. You will find devout, praying God believers falling on both sides of those issues. God believers don't agree with each other. So where is this absolute morality? That doesn't disprove God, but it is an evidence against the existence of a God who gives us moral, moral standards. Another argument against the existence of God, of course, is the problem of evil. All you have to do is walk into any children's hospital, and you know there is no God. Children are in pain. They are suffering. Their parents are desperately praying for God to protect them. They're praying Jesus or God or, or, or Elohim or whoever, protect my child, and the children die. They don't survive. Occasionally, according to uh, statistics, some of them will get better, prayed for or not. And, of course, the believers think, well, that's proof of prayer. But uh, uh, in my family, we had a traumatic situation where my wife did survive, not because of invoking prayer, but because of invoking good medical attention. Um, on September 11th, Hassanain, those God believers who committed that act of terrorism uh, had a foreknowledge of the evil that they wanted to do. They had a belief in a God, in a, they had a belief in a heaven. And it's not only Muslims, but it's believers of all stripes who commit horrible acts. What if you had known what was in the mind of those, those terrorists? What if you had known about it in advance? <laughs> And what if you had the ability to stop it without any risk to yourself? Would you have stopped them? I would have. I'm sure you're a good man, and you would have stopped it. You would have stopped the bloodshed. You would have stopped the trauma. I would have as a good human moral person. 
if you say yes, you would have stopped it, then you're nicer than God. Because God had the foreknowledge, God had the power to stop the brutality, but he did nothing about it. In my book, he is something of a moral accomplice. Also, uh, besides these evidences for God's non-existence, I don't see any need to believe in a God. You can live a good moral life, a happy life, a reasonable life, a compassionate life. Even Jesus said, they who are whole don't need a doctor. Well, most of us atheists consider that we are not sick. We are not sinners. We don't have this need for some master up there to whom we can bow as a slave. And we can live good lives without the belief in a God. So uh, my time is up, Muhammad tells me, and we will now move to the next phase.